So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've got uh, nearly 40 people on the call. Um, this is a call that is going around the world in every time zone, and it's a 24 hour conference. I think it's the first time the Global Greens have tried something like this. So it's wonderful that you've joined us, uh, and I hope everybody's having a good conference. My name is Scott Ludlam. Um, I'm a former Australian Greens uh, Senator. I'm speaking to you today in the afternoon from the traditional country of the Dhiranganj people of the Yuan nation on land over which sovereignty was never ceded, land which was taken by force from the traditional owners uh, who have been custodians of this place for tens of thousands of years. Um, wherever you are in the world, um, you're on traditional ground. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got uh, an incredible panel of people from all over the planet who are speaking with us today. Um, the session is really is loosely framed around how can the Global Greens be more effective? How can we work better together to support the work that we do collectively? But I want to acknowledge that not all of our panelists have had close association with the Greens. What they do have is in common, uh, in common is that they are incredible fighters for justice in different ways and in different parts of the world. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from each of you. Um, as we, as we discuss uh, how can we be better networked? How can we support each other better? How can we become more powerful um, given the magnitude of what we are collectively up against? And what can we learn from each other? So I'm really, really looking forward to the session. Um, we've got a couple of housekeeping items to get out of the way first, and then I'll introduce you to these extraordinary people. Um, we have, uh, because of the very hard work of the interpretation team, We've got simultaneous interpretation into Japanese. I think we have three interpreters on the line with us today. Um, you will see at the bottom of the Zoom window, you have the option of choosing English or Japanese. If you would like this session translated into Japanese, please click uh, the Japan, uh, Japanese option down at the bottom and then you'll be able to hear the speakers in real time in Japanese. And thank you to our interpreters for, for doing that for us. This session is going to be recorded and so that we can make it available to a much larger audience uh, of friends and supporters. So just please be aware, uh, don't, don't say anything that you don't want to be recorded on this call. And the, uh, the only other thing in terms of housekeeping is that I'm on a very sketchy regional internet connection. If I disappear, I'm the least important person in this conversation, please carry on without me and I'll join you again as soon as I can. All right. Oh, only other thing for housekeeping. Um, we are going to be taking questions. The session is nice and long. Please put your questions into the chat as they occur to you. Uh, and Nick is gonna be grabbing the questions out and throwing them into a document so we can start uh, bringing, bringing your uh, questions and interests into the call a little bit later in the session. Um, do that anytime at all, just throw those questions into the chat and we'll be grabbing them as we go. All right, so. Our four panelists today are really remarkable. So I'm just gonna introduce each of them very briefly in turn, uh, and then we um, will hear from each of them in turn about uh, their work. So I'd uh, like to introduce, so firstly of our four panelists, the Honorable Martin Ogindo, who is a Kenya Greens MP, the leader of the Greens uh, Congress of Kenya, uh, and was also a Global Greens COP26 delegate. His very long association um, with the Green Movement and the Green Party. Uh, former member of parliament from 2008 to 2013 um, and has, has uh, worked in a variety of roles in the parliamentary context for the Greens in Kenya. And I'm very looking forward to hearing um, from Martin. Our second speaker, uh, Marinel Ubaldo, is an advocate for climate justice and the environment. She's a registered social worker and one of the founders of the Youth Leaders for Environmental Action Federation, which is a youth led organization uh, based in Eastern Visayas that aims to mentor youth individuals and organizations in climate advocacy. She's also the advocacy officer for ecological justice and youth engagement of living Laudato Si Philippines. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, and, and has an incredible bio and an incredible um, uh, amount of work that she's been doing. Our third speaker, Julian Aguan, is a human rights lawyer and writer from Guam in the Pacific. He's the author of The Properties of Perpetual Light and the founder of Blue Ocean Law, a progressive firm that works at the intersection of indigenous rights and environmental justice. He is a member of the council, or I should say, I guess the cabinet of the Progressive International, which is a network that I am hoping uh, 
um, to speak a little bit more about in our session today so that folks working with the Global Greens can discover a bit more about the Progressive International and vice versa. And our fourth panelist um, who's joining us, really pleased to welcome Vasha uh, Gandikota, who is also on the Progressive International's cabinet. And she is the coordinator of the PI's policy wing, which is called Blueprint, has also a remarkable background, a feminist economic justice advocate, a, a Princeton graduate, has worked in NGOs, has worked in civil society, has worked as a policy fellow uh, with the Economic Development Board of the Government of Andhra Pradesh in India. So these four incredible individuals from all over the world are going to share their stories, their experiences, and help us build a more powerful green movement. Um, Martin, would you like to kick off 10 minutes or so? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. And uh, first of all, my name is Martin Ogindo, and uh, I'm tuning in from Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, I'd like to be clear that um, I've been in politics and uh, I want to speak from that perspective. Uh, so a little bit of my presentation may not be researched, so I'm just speaking from the top of my head. So please appreciate. and. Uh, I, I want to say that I'm 55 years of age and uh, I joined politics in 2008 where I served my first term. And during my first term, I had an opportunity to attend, uh, I mean, by virtue of being a member of the environment committee in my parliament, I had an opportunity to attend uh, COP16, I guess, that was in uh, Cancun, Mexico. And in that process, I got the inspiration to associate myself with the green ideology. Uh, I was attending one of the side events and uh, the presentation was about climate change and the challenge was, what are you doing as an individual to impact on uh, redeeming our planet. And from there, I came back to Kenya. And uh, after a while, I saw sight and I decided that the only contribution I could make was to create a political party, which I would use to mobilize people into appreciating the need to conserve our planet. And that's how I and some young Kenyans founded the Green Congress Party of Kenya in 2016. Uh, I've since been incorporated into our regional green uh, movement body, which is the East Africa Greens Federation. And then naturally I was accommodated or included in the Africa Green Federations. And then that was escalated to Global Greens. So I am a member of the Global Greens, and I am a member of the Global Green Coordination. So uh, speaking on the increasing impact of the Global Greens as a political movement, I'd like to say that uh, as a background, personally, I have struggled to really domesticate the green ideology so that it can be understood in my locality. And uh, because we are borrowing from the English phraseologies, we, we normally struggle to get it into the local language so that it can be understood and appreciated. Of course, we all are aware of the impact and effects of climate change, but uh, you will find that in some areas, people still attribute this to nature or divine actions. And uh, really, in a region where politics is personality-based or ethnic-based, uh, people don't think that, indeed, the green ideology is a political ideology worth paying attention to. Uh, but that is the challenge that we have. To that extent, 
it still looks like uh, the green ideology is an ideology that is looking for affirmative action and that it is not yet a mainstream agenda. So I think to that extent, we really need to work very hard so that we can truly make the green ideology a political philosophy that people can use to judge leaders. And because it is an ideology that can be uh, accounted for. If you make progress on it, people can see. If you don't, people can see. So I think our green ideology is a very, very powerful ideology that I think will withstand the test of time as opposed to other ideology. And I think as a green, I'm proud to be part of this. We have done a lot of work uh, at the cross-border level because the evolution of the green movement, I know, started uh, way back in the early days when people were agitating for environmental conservation. And then later, these were converted into political parties. I think uh, following the Earth Summit meeting, it was agreed that mere activism will not take us far. We needed to convert into political parties so that we can be effective, influence policy and influence legislation. I think uh, that has seen a lot of progress and uh, many green parties have come up and uh, quite a number have representation. And I think that's a great progress for this uh, green, uh, political movement. I've seen that uh, at the cross-border level, people are on different political spaces, which make some parties thrive and which uh, political spaces suffocate polit other political parties. Most of the green political parties are young political parties and uh, they really need to find their space in a spectrum that is dominated by traditional and conservative political parties. And I think it's a big, big challenge. So in our cross-border work, and thanks to the Global Greens, we have been able to borrow from other jurisdictions and see how their political space work and favor them. And one of the areas I've worked on is uh, on the electoral reform. In my country, Kenya, we are operating under fast pass the post system of uh, elections. And uh, I think this system of election really suffocates young upcoming political parties. And we struggle really to get representation because whatever number of votes you get, it all counts for nothing if you're not a winner. And uh, I remember the last time I lost my election uh, after I got uh, 16,000 votes and uh, my winner got 24,000 votes and I lost and my votes counted for nothing. So I think it has been very, very useful working at the cross-border level to see how proportional representation is working in other countries, especially in Europe. And uh, thanks to proportional representation that is working in Africa, today we have representation in Rwanda, uh, where my friend, uh, Dr. Frank Hibineza comes from. And I think that has been courtesy of uh, the global movement that we have had those exchanges. Of course, uh, it has not been easy to influence legislation in the global South generally. And this is uh, because of this political space that we are operating in. So let me just say something about uh, uh, improving uh, the, the, the impact of green political parties, uh, I mean, sub strategies. I think it is imperative that we highlight the impact of green parties, especially on pollution, global warming, warming 
and uh, mainstreaming of gender equality, inclusion of marginalized groups. I think we have been very, very strong on this and uh, we have had a lot of impact. And today, people who are polluting the environment would have to look over their shoulders whether the greens are around. And uh, people who are contributing to global warming are on their alert, even though they are still powerful, but they know there's somebody watching that would call them to account. And uh, in many countries, we have seen gender equality mainstreamed. We've seen countries that are led by women, Finland, we've seen Germany, and these countries appear to be scoring higher on governance than countries that are led by men. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, our voice have not been in vain. Uh, you get the best of a society when you level the play playing ground. I also want to add that uh, in order to mainstream ourselves as a political movement, we need to enhance our creativity in resource mobilizations. At least this creativity needs to be enhanced globally and uh, locally because uh, a lot of politics is driven by ideology but catalyzed by resources. We need to have increased investment that will give our campaign increased visibility because otherwise our competitors will always have an edge of us and they will perpetuate the pollution, the global warming that is undermining everybody else on the globe. Lastly, I need to say that we also need to strengthen the global greens. And uh, to this end, I must say that as I speak today, we don't pass as a political movement. I mean, from my lenses, I think we still pass as a as a global body, uh, more of uh, as, 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 as activists, as NGOs, we look like we are the uh, plan international. Or we, 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 we don't strike somebody on first sight as a political movement. And I think that branding needs to take place. Uh, we need to give more political faces to the movement at global level. I know we have a board. I know we have a coordination team. I, I know we have the executive uh, committee and the coordination team. I think we deserve to have a board that will give us the face of politics. There are very many people who have uh, green credentials all over the world. And uh, if every continental federation could be represented by one person to the Global Greens Board that would make it have a political face, I think we will have impact uh, because people uh, want to look at your credentials and your track record if they are to believe what you're saying. And uh, I think, uh, there are very many people. One of our own, Scott Ladlam, is here. I mean, is an experienced uh, senator. I mean, if the people of Australia hear that board of the Global Greens, a member is Scott Ladlam, then they will see that this is a political movement. I mean, uh, Helen Clark, Ralph Nada, Al Gore, David Cameron, Frank Habineza, Angela Merkel, Barbara Box, we have so many people that we can choose from to, to, to give our movement a political face and rebrand it. Lastly, I think uh, I'm so happy to be part of this global movement. It gives me a lot of inspiration and uh, it gives me a platform to engage and uh, to make a change that we need on our planet. Scott, I want to end there. 
amazing, Martin. There are a few surprises there that you threw in. Um, it's really wonderful to hear from you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and for sharing your experiences with us. Marinelle. I, ho I hope I didn't oh, overshoot yeah. my time. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're all right. This is a nice long session. Um, Marinelle, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, coming from several time zones east of Nairobi. Uh, I've given you a very quick introduction, but I know I didn't do your work justice. So please feel free, go ahead. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, hi everybody, I'm Marina Lobaldo. I am um, currently in my hometown um, in Matarino, South Side of Eastern Samar in the Philippines. Um, so we are at the end of a peninsula, which is facing the Pacific Ocean. This is the place where I grew up in, and this is the place where I have been used to fleeing and evacuating every other disaster because um, we are on the front line of every other disaster um, being um, facing the Pacific Ocean. My father is a fisherman, and I started um, my climate advocacy when, when I was 12 years old. Then Super Typhoon High and happened in 2013, which actually um, enlightened me of how climate change would really affect and devastate our community and my family. I have seen a lot of people, a lot of dead bodies floating on the ocean. I have seen how my community have struggled. I've seen how my family have struggled to get back to our feet. And since Typhoon High and um, there are so many monstrous typhoon that also occurred, also hit the Philippines. Just last December um, 18th, we had um, Super Typhoon Rai that devastated a lot of communities um, in the Philippines. So my personal experience of, um, of the climate crisis is the root cause why I am in this advocacy. That was the time when I started lobbying with the government. Um, sending petition and ordinances with the government because we I truly believe that alongside um, rallying and protesting on the street, it is also very important that we partner and work with the government because it, it, it is them who actually legislate laws and they are actually the one creating laws. And we partner with them on how we can amend and how we can implement the laws already, the existing law, laws already because in the Philippines, we have a lot of laws, just that they are not implemented well on the grassroots level. And in 2020, the Philippines was the second most dangerous country to be an environmentalist because a lot of environmental defenders have been killed and a lot of indigenous people have been killed um, during that time and up until now, since our government is not really friendly to environmental advocates, we have been losing friends in the environmental advocacy um, who are being killed. And that is just though that is just one of the struggles that we have he, we have here in the Philippines, alongside surviving, you know, every other disaster. So I have committed my life to bringing justice to our community and to other vulnerable communities because the Philippines is just emitting very small amount of carbon emission. Yet we are the first one to, to be hit by disasters. We are the first victims of climate disasters. And I think it is just unfair that a lot of corporations are profiting from the suffering of these vulnerable communities. And the first world countries and our leaders, international leaders, should be really taken um taken into accountability so yes that's a bit of my background and now i am working with a lot of youth organization from around the world to bring change and to um and to make sure that our policies are implemented well in the grassroots and making sure that the stories from the grassroots are actually being told in the international um stage by the people who have experienced them and not just the other climate activists from the global north telling the stories of other people from the global south because it is really important that we give a human face to the climate crisis and storytelling is really important in this advocacy i think thank you so much scott i would have been happy if you went for another half an hour um thank you for being on the call and for being so inspiring 
um, and for for um, speaking of your experience. Scott, we Scott, lost you. Your throat. I told you my internet was garbage. So you've just missed my really inspiring introduction to Julian. But um, if you can hear me again, uh, please take Maybe the call and just... let us know. Great. Let us know a little bit about you and your work. Thanks for coming on the on the call. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. okay. Um, my name is Julian. Again, I'm an Indigenous tomorrow uh, activist um, and more recently law lawyer. So I um, work on a, a range of issues primarily these days through the firm that I founded. Um, it's called Blue Ocean Law. And we um, work on a variety of international human and Indigenous rights issues environmental justice issues, um, some of the core campaigns and sort of the cases that we've taken on have ranged from political and economic self-determination, um, the right to free prior informed consent. Um, we've taken on extractive interest industries such as the emerging extractive industry known as seabed mining, uh, which is particularly concerning to Pacific Island communities. Um, we've worked on restorative justice campaigns um, here in Guam and elsewhere in the region. Um, maybe I'm going rushing through this too quickly. I think I have a little bit of time to so unpack that a tiny bit more. Um, for example, um, for our self-determination work, we have been sort of active in the courts. We've been litigating for a, a little over a decade to protect the right of the native inhabitants of Guam to exercise self-determination in accordance with international law. Um, there have been legal challenges seeking to subvert that decolonization process. Um, Guam remains one of 17 recognized non-self-governing territories um, who are not who basically are formally slated for an act of decolonization and um, various, there's a, there's a wide cast of characters that are all vested sort of in blocking that process. So we have been intimately involved in defending the right of self-determination here. Um, we've worked with other communities across the Pacific. Our firm is very, very Pacific focused. Um, so we have, we're kind of like like, I guess I would say maybe like ghost writers or invisible sort of members of the international lawyers for West Papua. We are very concerned about the denial of the right to self-determination um, to the West Papuan people by Indonesia. We have worked um, on the ground and through policy and like legal analysis. We've tried to basically arm civil society groups from a variety of island countries, um, most recently French Polynesia. We've worked um, to try to basically disaggregate this whole like body of laws and policies that, you know, um, that France has sort of imposed on um, the, the, the on French Polynesia, Tahiti, and everywhere else. I mean, we've kind of helped um, different sort of parties. We work with government and civil society. Um, to basically try to operationalize the norms of international law, be it um, self-determination in those contexts or uh, protecting free prior informed consent um, amidst the sort of global scramble to mine the mineral wealth at the bottom of the sea. So uh, deep sea mining is a huge campaign that we've taken on. We probably were like eight years so deep into sort of analyzing not only all of the Pacific Island countries, legal and regulatory frameworks that governs deep sea mining, but also the European Union touted mo so-called model regulatory framework. So the EU essentially has funded the entire sort of bankroll is like green lighting of this new extractive industry, which poses great harm um, to the people and, and the environments of several Pacific Island nations. Um, and I, I should explain also on this note that a disproportionate share of the sort of mineral wealth that's located in hydrothermal vents and on the deep sea floor actually are in or around the EEZs of 14 Pacific Island countries. So it's so this is a really concentrated area. Um, I guess 
for restorative justice work that we've done as a firm, we have worked very closely with the Republic of the Marshall Islands for uh, many years. Um, on helping the country diversify their sort of portfolio of redress regimes. So we're trying to help the country analyze the various domestic, uh, meaning US federal, as well as international sort of legal mechanisms, legal handles that exist to try to pursue justice for a variety of unresolved historic harms. So those include not just the sort of ongoing radio presence of radiation, you know, the contamination from the US's nuclear testing program in the islands, but also from um, a lesser known legacy of non-consensual medical experimentation. So like when we helped um, former President Hilda Heine create the National Nuclear Commission, which is like the one body that houses sort of all of the restorative justice efforts for the Marshall Islands uh, with respect to taking the US to task to finally clean up and remediate their contamination. Uh, we more recently work on climate change issues in the region. We are assisting Vanuatu uh, with a climate justice effort at this moment. Um, that's sort of the gist of what Blue Ocean Law does. We kind of just work on a variety of issues, but what I do more personally, I mean, I'm also, I sort of like, I'm a lawyer by day, but I mean moonlight as a writer. So I'm, I'm also so convinced um, as the sort of previous speaker had mentioned, the absolute centrality, the the necessity of better storytelling. Uh, you know, like recently in the in a Schumacher lecture from George Monbiot, he actually made a really good point about the failure of the left in some ways is replacing what we see because everywhere we look, you know, the sort of predatory global capitalism, you know, and its narrative and its ethos of endless extractivism, right? Um, it, it, it's really sort of on display as falling spectacularly apart. But part of the failure of the left, the conspicuous failure is to replace that narrative with a new one. So like part of what I'm trying to do now, more recently <clears throat> and most prominently in my recent book is trying to sort of argue for alternatives in a real way, you know, trying to, to basically sort of, this is, I think what the last speaker was mentioning as well, like the importance of storytelling, it, like climate change is the perfect sort of like crystallization of that failure, you know, in terms of filling the narrative gap, because we have like very clear, you know, there is no ambiguity about who is the perpetrator and who is the victim. There is no ambiguity about who has actually caused the harm and taken up atmospheric space and who has not, you know, and like all of those conversations, but those are sort of like dominated, the international conversation just to take climate change as one example is dominated by the cold language of mitigation and adaptation. What do we do with the warm blooded longings for equity and justice? How do we accommodate them? And part of what we're doing is we're not reaching for the right vocabulary with which to graft our own will upon the world. We have not successfully grafted our own vision, you know, our alternative vision. And that's what the Global Greens and other groups are trying to do. And that's the last thing I'll say is that's why I'm particularly excited about being involved with the work of Progressive International, because it's, it's just a bunch of really, really committed social change agents who are just like, I don't almost dazzlingly brilliant in different ways, you know, and when you see us all kind of get together and work on different campaigns, it's pretty arresting. And also, lastly, now I realize I'm talking too much. But lastly, I will say that I actually feel more hopeful this year than I did last more last year than I did the year before that, and why? Because I'm actually engaged in community with other people who give a damn and who are brilliant and are committing sort of the entirety of their sort of intellectual gifts, you know, in service of bringing about a different kind of world. I mean, and that gives me hope. And, you know, and I think that's, I'm happy to be here, thanks. Excuse me, you are not talking too much. That was incredible and, uh, Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more as we get deeper into the session. Our final panelist who's been waiting extremely patiently, Varsha, um, please come forward and take the call and let us know what you're working on and um, whereabouts you are, because I think I missed that in my intro. Go ahead. Thank you, Scott. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Varsha Gandikota Nalitla. I'm uh, calling in from Hyderabad in India. Um, and I work at the Progressive International, which has been uh, very generously introduced both by Scott and Julian, who sit alongside me on uh, the PI cabinet, which is filled with wonderful scholars and activists and social movements and trade unions from all around the world. 
uh, Progressive International, for those of you who don't know, is a global initiative with precisely this mission to unite, organize, and mobilize progressive forces from around the world. Um, you know, individuals like yourself, political parties, left-wing movements, and unions with sort of a very simple idea, right? The pandemic has very clearly laid bare the fatal flaws of, you know, hyper-globalization, the breakdown of essentially kind of just-in-time production, you know, coupled with uh, diminished state capacity and a public sector that's essentially been eroded over, over decades, over half a century of privatization and ravaged domestic responses to health. It's clear that only a common international front, very much like what the Global Greens are trying to do here, can match the scale of our crisis, you know, planetary solutions for planetary crisis. It's the only way we can actually reclaim our institutions and defeat also politically kind of a rising authoritarian nationalism that we're seeing across the world. So for us at Progressive International, um, you know, the mission is very, very simple. It's how do we make solidarity more than a slogan? So in our short while of being around, which is about you know, a little under two years, we've experimented with this question in a few different ways, right? From defending democracy against, um, you know, electoral intervention, we've sent delegations to Bolivia, to Ecuador, to Chile, to now to Costa Rica, where we've, ha we've had left-wing candidates participate in elections, actually have chances of winning and won, as we've seen in Chile, but have, um, you know, have been uh, and, and under attack and the onslaught of right-wing kind of um, attacks, whether that's by tech censorship, press censorship, so on and so forth across across uh, across the globe. But we've also united nurses from 29 countries, unions that came together to say, we actually stand for the health of not just, you know, people in our country, but our counterparts, doctors and nurses in other parts of the world, and who've, who've lodged a legal complaint against rich country governments, a handful of them, including the European, gov European Union, um, who've been blocking uh, waiver on patents that will help get access to vaccines around the world. And of course, say something like the Make Amazon Pay campaign, which if you don't know, again, I would uh, you know, highly recommend that you look up, which organized a global strike in 25 different countries where Amazon workers, gig workers, you know, Uber drivers, everyone kind of came together to say, we stand against Amazon, we demand climate justice, we demand labor justice, we demand data justice in a coordinated fashion where we know that these movements and this activism was happening around the world, but they came together for a global day of action. So just as Julian said, you know, I think all of us in our minds, we've constantly been saying another world is possible. We know that this wretched one that we're currently living in simply cannot continue. So the question before all of us is how do we, how do we set out to build it? So for, as for my sake, I lead the policy work at Progressive International, but one project that I've been working on is on COVID-19 vaccine internationalism. Scott has um, you know, asked me to speak a little bit about this. And if you'll allow me, you know, I wanted to kind of share, talk a bit about what the pandemic has been like and what this discovery of COVID-19 vaccines has been like, right? The beginning of this year, less than a month ago, I don't know how many of you know this, but we began with what is essentially in the World Health Organization called a tsunami of new COVID-19 cases. It's, a, it's the highest number of infections that we've ever had since the beginning of the pandemic, all the way back in 2020. With this conversation about Omicron being mild, I think everyone's just kind of forgotten that with each new wave, we are actually you know, hitting record new infections every single time. But the world remains perilously under-vaccinated. You know, 92 of the World Health Organization's member countries have all missed the 2021 target of vaccinating themselves. And now we've seen in the records that 109 of them are estimated to miss it even in 2022. And these statistics tell a, base, a story of kind of a consistent vaccine apartheid, right? Across the European Union, 80% of all adults have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Meanwhile, only 9.5% of people in low-income countries have received even a single dose. And this number is, you know, something like 3% in the entire continent of Africa, under 1% in countries like Syria. And so for me, it's baffling how on earth are we still in the situation nearly two years into the pandemic where, you know, majority of the countries in the world find themselves arms outstretched, essentially waiting for charity from a handful of other countries. And importantly for all of us here today, you know, what can we do today that will ensure that when the next crisis comes, this won't be the case. So when I got into this work, you know, it's clear that the institutions that have been empowered to address this, you know, what is what we've been calling a vaccine apartheid are failing to deliver. If you look at what happened during this pandemic, right, within months of the first case, the Chinese authorities kind of sequenced the virus, shared that information. And I think it was the New York Times that ran a headline that said COVID-19 has changed how the world does science, you know, together. And I certainly believed it. And 
you know, maybe it's an embarrassing admission and I'm sure at least some of you did that we're going to do things differently this time, right? Maybe it was naive optimism, but what followed has been so absolutely miserable. The World Health Organization said, let's set up this thing. Let's have a common pool of vaccines. Let's discover all of our technology together. Anything that comes out of it, we'll all use together. A day before it could even make this announcement, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, all the other big pharma companies convened a press conference anticipating this announcement and opposing any challenge to patents, saying this would be terrible for the world. And over the next few months, this assault continued, right? When Pfizer learned that Australia was considering you know, supporting a waiver of patent protections, they made a submission in the parliament saying it would harm supply, it would harm safety and so on. And of course, there were a huge army you know, of people at their behest to submit all sorts of policy documents um, to this effect. And I think it was Anne Pritchard, who was the senior vice president of the pharma company, who you know, repeatedly claimed this is disastrous for innovation. And so, of course, you know, this initiative of working together now gathers dust and no one, not a single company has shared its vaccine technology as of yet. But, you know, one might say this is just what's expected of pharma companies, right? What about the other actors in the system? What do we expect of our governments, of international bodies set up to deal with the pandemic? And uh, which, by the way, ended up being led by the same executives, right, by pharma companies. So if you look at the investigative work done by someone like Corporate Europe Observatory, about who meets with the European Commission to discuss the scarcity of COVID-19 vaccines, it turns out it's exclusively, you know, the European Commissioner met only with lobbyists and pharma company executives who, of course, only wanted to uphold patents, uphold kind of legal protections and keep vaccine recipes under lock and key. And someone like, you know, the head of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the, you know, Doctors Without Borders, was denied even a single meeting when they when the European Commission took something like 117 or 125 meetings with pharma lobbyists. If you think about someone like Bill Gates, who actively stopped as to, you know Oxford from sharing its vaccine with the world, which we now discover again because of investigative journalism, they actually wanted to do so. And Bill Gates kind of stepped in and said, "No, you know, I have given a 750 million dollar donation, um, you know, to this institute, and leveraging that, I think you guys shouldn't share the." shouldn't share the vaccine. I say all of this to say, this is the story everywhere, right? It's been public taxpayer money that's gone into the development of Moderna, vaccine funded almost entirely by US taxpayer money, Oxford AstraZeneca funded mainly by UK taxpayer money, but none of these vaccines actually belong to us. None of these vaccines belong to the people that have funded it because the governments have signed away the right to health of people across the world. So if we, if we kind of look at um, you know, how we can change the situation. When I began working on vaccine internationalism at Progressive International, it was clear the proposals from the World Bank, from the IMF, from, you know, the World Trade Organization and G7, the premise on providing charity to the global South, right? It was always about donations, donations, and donations, because they want to entrench the dependence of these nations on essentially their global North neighbors. So they're not solutions, but only maneuvers really to distract from, you know, the true nature of the system, which is built to empower big pharma. Right, essentially, which is essentially kind of a cartel to control the lives of billions of people around the world. I think the clearest articulation of this came perhaps um, from someone in Boris Johnson's cabinet who talked about building a NATO for public health, which is of course you know a terrifying thought. So what's at stake here, you know, if, is very clearly the sovereignty of the South. We're witnessing the ills of nationalism, imperialism, racial capitalism all play out in some of the most grotesque of ways in the vaccine race. And that's why this issue perhaps is one of the most important struggles of our time. And as activists for us, you know, on the left, we have to be concerned with changing the system underneath it. So in June of this year, PI organized a summit, something we call the Summit for Vaccine Internationalism. Uh, which came out of this real sense of urgency, right? That we can't wait for, you know, the G7 to find its common sense or its conscience, that we need solutions that, you know, reinforce, that, uh, that don't, that undermine rather than reinforce the dependency of global South governments on big pharma and the countries where they're headquartered. So we brought together national governments of Argentina, Mexico, Bolivia, Cuba, Venezuela, regional governments of Kusumu County in Kenya, the Kerala government uh, in India, and political leaders from 20 countries to come, to come together to say, how can we have a solution for the global South, from the global South? And we found a huge champion in Cuba, a small island nation that's been battling, you know, a six decade long economic blockade, who've managed to develop three homegrown vaccines of their own, and, you know, are essentially in the brink of economic disaster, and they turn out to be the first country that said, we offer our vaccines to the world. 
we will offer our technology, we will send as many vaccines as we can make to everywhere that we can send them. We will send our doctors and medical teams to give out these vaccines to, to people in the countries that we send them to. And we'll openly collaborate with anyone that's interested in setting up joint you know, scientific um, institutes, collaborate on sharing the knowledge that we've developed over the years. And we'll ensure that any of these vaccines are only sold at solidarity prices. And these are the announcements that we made at the summit six months ago, further reinforced again, you know, at a delegation that Progressive International uh, visited Cuba earlier, earlier this month in January, where once again, the Cubans addressed the world and made this offer. So if I could return maybe for a moment to the hope brought about, you know, by that unprecedented nature of collaboration in April of 2020, I, I guess as progressives, we should all be asking, how can we support this kind of radical possibilities in public health? Looking to countries like Cuba, but also looking to, you know, workers across the pharma supply chain, storage companies, shipping industry, plastics, chemicals, and how can we support trade unions in these places to stand in solidarity with the people of the global south? How can progressive movements engage in collective disobedience? One of the big ideas that came out of Cuba's championship is to say, we now have a block, right? We as political progressive political parties in different countries have a champion to rally behind and negotiate as a block. Say we won't buy from big pharma companies. We'll in fact say only buy from Cuba. And so how might we you know, um, engage in collective disobedience against new imperial rules and regulations embodied by our international institutions? So I, I wanna wrap up, I realize I've taken a lot of time. I just wanna say the summit for me, I think was the beginning of a new and powerful alliance, not just to end this pandemic, but to really bring in something like a new international health order and um, which we're very clear eyed about where this sits, which is in the larger process of decolonization, which I know is extremely important for all of you here. And as Global Greens, when you think about how you have the responsibility to carry forward a politics of sustainability that measures up to the scale of today's challenge, uh, that really, really has to be about connecting to third world movements on the front lines of the climate crisis, as many of my fellow panelists have already talked about. So I'll stop there, but it was wonderful, wonderful to share a bit about this with all of you. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. That was really incredible. And I feel kind of excited also that that was recorded so that a lot of people can hear that incredible pitch. Um, we might have lost Martin briefly. So uh, Nick, I wonder if you are able to chase him and see where he's, see where he's got to if he's having connection difficulties. Um, Varsha has led us directly and really beautifully into the second thing I wanted to ask, which was given the nature of this forum and this party, I wanted to ask about internationalism and how working across borders has made your work possible or has it made it more difficult or your thoughts on internationalism and kind of busting out of our these artificially enclosed nation states and working across borders. Um, Marinelle, do you have any thoughts that you want to share on that in the context of your work? Yes, actually, um, it was 2015 when I um, started engaging with the international community. And at first, I was just, you know, a girl from a very remote community in the Philippines. And I thought nobody would ever be interested to listen to me. But then when I was in COP21 in Paris, um, it was uh, um, it was the time that I that I realize that there are actually a lot of stories out there and the Philippines is just one of the vulnerable countries around the wor world who are suffering from the effects of the climate crisis and it was the time that I was able to connect with a lot of people and share our experiences and our advocacy works and try to um, try to replicate all the works that they are doing in our country if they can be replicated and all the works that we are doing here in our country to their country. So it was more a share of knowledge and a share of works that we are doing since a lot of us um, have the same um, geographical uh, demographics, I mean. So I, I thought that it helped me a lot to understand how things are going outside the Philippines. And it actually gave, it actually made me realize that, you know, we are all connected. That whatever would happen, whatever is happening in the Philippines or in other parts of the world could also happen in the rich countries in the world. And we should not ever ex exclude ourselves um, thinking that, um, thinking that, you know, we are the 
if uh, because I have a lot of people that I know in in rich countries are thinking like you know Philippines is so far away from us Africa is so far away from us or Laos or Vietnam or Malaysia is so far away from us and whatever is happening us there is happening because they are a developing country and that is so sad to just feel like you know you, you are in a, just because you are in the US or you are in Europe or you are in Australia or Canada you are safe from the from the effects of the climate crisis because the climate crisis does not just occur um, through a typhoon or through extreme weather event it also you can also feel it in the in the in the sources of your food the sources of of the basic necessities your basic necessities so, so even if you don't feel that um, you are, even if you feel that you are not directly affected, well, you are still affected because there are so many sources of your basic necessities that is threatened by the climate crisis and even your human rights because climate crisis is the greatest threat to human rights. And that is very true in all around, in, in so many places around the world. And if the climate crisis will continue, I could not imagine um, in 10, 10 years or 15 years, uh, since I am just 24 years old, I don't imagine myself just surviving another typhoon or just surviving another disaster. I want, um, I want, that in 10 years or in five years, I am still reaching my dreams. I am still, um, I am applying for a job that I really want. I am, um, I am pursuing my master's degree or my doctoral degree by that time. And I do not, I can't imagine my future children, you know, being deprived or the, of their basic human right because we did not do drastic action today. And that is that is something. Those realization um, was because of my engagement with the international community. That we can actually work together in order to provide um, solutions in our own communities. I have been in the grassroots community. I have been in grassroots activism since I was 12 years old. And I could share the knowledge that we have in the communities and the international platform and share all the learnings that I've got in policies on technical know-how from the international community to our grassroots, to our communities locally here in the Philippines. So that is kind of, a, exchange of um, exchange of ideas and exchange of um, project ideas and um, and advocacy work so internationalism it kind of um, kind of showed me you know how vast we can still do how, how big we can still do and how amazing we could still um, how we could still do so many amazing things together because we can't do it alone nobody could just you know, turn things, nobody could just do, create change alone or just a few people. We really need all hands on deck. We really need everybody to be really active on climate justice advocacy because it is not just for us, it is not just for our families, but it is also for the next generation that would inherit all, all of that we have on this earth. And that is also for other vulnerable countries around the world. Because I always say this whenever I talk to people that, you know, doing your small gesture for the environment is a selfless act. Why? Because you are not just doing that for yourself or for your community. You are also doing that for us, even if we are on the other side of the world, because that is how we are interconnected. And whatever we give to the environment would give it would give it back to us in other forms so yes thank you i thought i was not lost in that hello can you still hear me yeah we've still got you that was wonderful thank you you were you were nice okay. and clear all the way through um we had a request a short while ago and this is directed as much at myself as any of the other panelists to speak a little bit slowly they're struggling to keep up with this. They're doing simultaneous translation into Japanese. So if we can all just be a little bit uh, careful and otsukare sama desu to our translation team, we will try and look after you. Um, 
Julian, internationalism, and then I'll throw back to you, Martin. Sure. Um, I don't know if I have anything particularly profound to say other than I think it's obvious that, you know, the borders that you're talking about are in our illusion. You know, we, we know that now. I mean, and people in power don't see borders and that's why they're winning. You know, so the, those of us who are opposing everything that's going down, we have to absolutely be done with silos and be done with borders. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so clear just on Guam. I mean, I'll, the most concrete example is the U.S. military is currently militarizing the hell out of my homeland. Um, it, is, um, it is basically implementing its decade-old plan to militarize the lands and the seas around this island. Um, and it's happening, you know, um, almost without any opposition from anyone else in the world other than our like grassroots activists here in Guam who've been opposing it so strenuously. Um, and basically we have challenged um, what's been happening in court. I'm, I'm also trying to speak a little slower than usual. So I, is this slow, slow enough for the translate? I think this, is, this should work, right? Um, so we have exhausted all of our sort of domestic legal remedies. There have been a multitude of lawsuits um, filed not just by my, by my firm, but other, other firms in the region, not only in Guam, but in Hawaii, Earth Justice, for example, the Center for Biological Diversity. So many of us have opposed various components of this very large scale military buildup of Guam. And so many of us have lost. And so it's become very clear that we need to internationalize our struggle. So we have built um, relationships um, with so many other communities that are similarly situated in that they're being militarized. I mean, so we have not only um, fellow Islanders, but we also have the people of Okinawa who've also suffered from sort of an enormous US military presence. We built alliances, um, including in Hawaii. Um, we have filed most recently, um, my firm represented Protehi La Texan, which is our grassroots organization that's opposing a massive live fire training range complex over a sacred area here. And we have basically, we wrote to the, we're trying to basically invoke the special procedures of the human um, office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. We wrote to the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples. Um, and believe it or not, we were pretty shocked because not only that special rapporteur, but multiple special rapporteurs issued a pretty historic joint allegation letter against the US really recently. You know, So part of what we're doing is we're saying, one, all of these rights that are being violated the right to self-determination, the right to a clean environment, the right to health, the right to life, the right to clean water, the right to free prime informed consent. These arise under international law, not US domestic law. This is, this is a gen, absolutely categorically an international human rights issue and it should be treated as such. So a lot of our groups have been successful only to the extent that we have reached across borders and involved the international community. And so like, and the US actually, the Biden administration was forced to respond and now we're responding to their response. So that's just a very concrete example um, because otherwise there would have been no, you know, nothing on the record because it's not as if the activists here believe that we can stop the Defense Department in their tracks. We, you know, some of us are prepared to lose, but we fight certain strategic battles anyway because it does larger things. Like even in even the lawsuits that we have filed in the federal courts that we have lost, part of what we're doing is not only do we understand that there are no borders anymore, there that even like even our ideas of our political imaginations have to be larger than our legal ones. You know, we we understand that we might lose in terms of narrow legal outcome, but we can win in terms of raising awareness. Um, and actually mobilizing people uh, to basically join our cause. And we've been pretty successful in a number of ways, but all of those ways I would say are because we've internationalized the struggle here. And so that has been really, really key to our success. Um, I think that's most of what I wanna say on the local context, but we see it, we see it all over and we, we kind of have to do that in every case. I mean, you know, like, I mean, like you folks in Australia have so much to work on. I mean, in terms of solidarity campaigns that can be even expanded. Uh, for example, the so Australia's offshore detention facilities are 
just nightmarish as all of you know, but you know, there should, I don't see enough of like these campaigns between Australian civil society and Pacific civil society groups. Like, I think those are connections. I mean, there are some, but I mean, there can be much more robust campaigns involving like the people, people, Nauruans who actually oppose what the government of Nauru is doing with regard to carrying out its part as the jailer. You know, there are things, you know, that we can get better on as well um, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That's brilliant and fiery, and I love it. Um, Martin, I think we lost you briefly. I'd ask the panelists how working across borders, working uh, within the idea of internationalism has helped or maybe made their work more difficult, but I wonder what your thoughts are um, in the context of working within uh, African Greens Federation and maybe working with Dr. Habaneza. Um, what your thoughts are on how working across borders and not just being stuck in our national context is helpful um, for you. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. I, I, I alluded to that in my presentation that uh, it has been of great significance, the cross-border work that we have done. Uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from uh, Frank Habineza because he's younger than me, but he started off as a young green and uh, they have grown the green movement in East Africa. And uh, today he's a member of parliament in Rwanda. And uh, from that, when we started the Green Congress Party in Kenya, we were easily accommodated into the regional organization, which is the Green East Africa Green Federation. And uh, eventually we ended up in Africa Green Federation and the Global Greens. So that has really been very, very effective in uh, helping the young green parties to lift themselves up into the national, regional, continental, and even the global stage. And uh, the other thing is, uh, it has been also very, very uh, uh, good opportunity when we see how the political spaces uh, in other countries operate. And uh, in Africa, we have proportional representation in Rwanda. And uh, that is how Frank Ebenezer, today they have three uh, members of parliament, uh, two senators and one uh, member of parliament, uh, member of, uh, uh, yes, parliament. So we draw a lot of inspiration from that. And we realize that in other countries, if only, we could have electoral reforms that would allow proportional representation, then the green votes would not go for waste, like they are going for waste in Kenya. And uh, if you are to get the green voices to the rightful places, uh, you need representation. Otherwise, it remains activism. And uh, uh, just the same way I've seen a question uh, about. Uh, about uh, nuclear uh, policy in, 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 uh, within the Green parties. I mean, the, 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 we are all divided in this uh, because uh, in, in Kenya and largely the global south, I think uh, our development trajectory has been leapfrogged and uh, we have been disrupted and uh, we are no longer in control of our development programs. Uh, you realize that uh, in the 90s, uh, the, the, the introduction of the structural adjustment programs really, really disrupted many countries in the South. Uh, uh, today, our social uh, justice system has collapsed. Uh, when you look at our 
healthcare, it is on its knees. When you look at our education, uh, it's struggling. When you look at our housing, uh, because everything was subjected to structural adjustments and uh, we were taken to the private sector at a time that we didn't have the resources to, uh, to, 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 to build uh, the, our, our private sector. So uh, most of the investments uh, are supposed to come from outside and they end up uh, uh, taking control of our strategic resources and uh, they use them for profit rather than for the well-being of the people. So we see that uh, indeed, uh, there, there has been disruption in, 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 in our lives in a manner that uh, really would require huge efforts to, to bring back to track. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's uh, the lessons that we learn from the cross border. Sometimes they make our work uh, better, sometimes they make our work difficult. Yes, Scott. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Um, it leads us, I think, maybe interestingly into the next one. And feel free not to have opinions about this if you don't want, but also have the strongest opinions if, if you like. Um, particularly for our friends who haven't had close association maybe with the Greens, either the Global Greens Network or parties um, in, um, in your own countries. What should, uh, Martin threw some ideas into this pot before, so let's kick off from there. What should the Global Greens be doing? What should the various federations of Green Parties be doing? What should the local uh, Green Parties be doing to make a more internationalist planet or to turn us into a movement? I'm interested in your comment, Martin, that it doesn't feel like a movement to you. I feel like we could have a session just on that. But from the point of view of the work that you've all described, uh, maybe Marinelle, if you would like to start us off on this one, if you feel like it, what is your wish list for the people listening in on this call and the people working within the within the green parties around the world? I think it should have been. We have been. We should have been doing this for a long time already. But um, but I think um, there is not much mainstreaming, even in news about the the green movement or the polit political movement that is focused on green. And even here in the Philippines, we do not have, well, we have now running, but we didn't have the green um, party really that is really um, focused on, on implementing um, environmental protection laws and, and project in, in communities. And, I just wish we have more of that. And I just wish there would be more youth that is involved in the, in the movement because we need to have more youth to be involved in this. I mean, we, know, we have seen how the youth is, you know, trying to be involved in a lot of processes in the climate movement, in the environmental protection. And we have been seeing a lot of people, a lot of youth lobbying with the government, even, even, even in the international, in the international, with the international leaders. And we have been um, seeing a lot of youth, a lot of youth stepping up to really make sure that the, the, the opinions and the ideas of the youth will be held into um, consideration when our leaders are, um, are deciding for what is the best for our planet. And we, I want to have more representation of the youth and more representation of the indigenous people, more representation of women in this kind of um, decision-making processes. Because um, even in COP26, we have seen it. Most of the leaders who have attended the COP26 in Glasgow was mainly men. There are just a few number of women. And it was so interesting, not in a positive way, because I was invited into a, a high level luncheon meeting in Glasgow. And I went there as a community representative. I was so, so, I was so ama amazed, again, not in a positive way, 
because a lot of the CEOs of these big corporations, big companies, they're actually on the front of, of the hall and all of the community representatives, the women, the indigenous people, the community people who have been invited, the youth are just at the back. And while um, these community representatives and sectors representatives were just given, they just allowed one representative for the women and for the youth to speak on behalf of the sector. These CEOs of these big corporations and companies were given five minutes each to speak about their um, their programs, uh, quote unquote, programs and, and innovations. And that is, uh, it shows a lot of how we, of how the inequality in this kind of, of even conferences. And I just wish that in, in the green movement, uh, especially in, in the Philippines or other, other countries, I just want to have more youth, more women, more indigenous people to be involved in this kind of processes because we cannot just disregard them. We need to have them on board and on deck. And that is my greatest wish list, to have that acknowledgement that these sectors are actually can, are able to make change happen, are able to be part of the solution, not just as a beneficiary, but also as part of those who are making changes because they are already making changes in their own communities and their own sectors. And we just need them to be supported. We, they, they just need, we just need to be supported. Thank you. Again, I am so grateful that we are recording this call. Thank you so much for that. I hope that that is written up in capital letters for everybody on the rest of the conference to read. Um, Julian, you got any thoughts? Give us your wish list. Um, well, just maybe just two main points. Again, I agree with Mayor now. Uh, I, I like all the points you raised. Honestly, I would just really advocate for the Greens to basically elevate the role of Indigenous peoples in sort of in this leadership. I mean, you know, so, I mean, Indigenous peoples absolutely have to be centrally involved in this project. I mean, you know, it, it is no exaggeration to say that Indigenous peoples sort of live closest to the earth. And so therefore, they are the most vulnerable to the vandalism visited upon it, you know, and they have a lot of the information necessary, you know, to inform like policy changes, but indigenous people's roles are, are net, they're, they're marginal, even when, even in, in agenda where agendas are set and that's not supposed to be the case. I've, I've just seen it so many times, not only in sort of the US context, but in many multilateral settings um, where the role of indigenous peoples are not elevated um, and their perspectives are not amplified. Um, so that's the first major thing. And the second thing is just to understand that the, the whole in conversation about militarism is part and par parcel of the conversation about climate justice. I mean, there is this tendency to divorce the two or bifurcate them or to, to see the sort of like, you know, the sort of anti-imperialism, anti-war work as being this separate wing of the work. But, you know, we, we see on Guam and we see throughout the islands here in Micronesia, where I'm from, that, you know, the, the worst polluter is the US military and it's, it's always, getting off scot-free it's just always off the hook it's off the hook because it's not figuring into a in a salient enough way in the climate justice conversation and so that's what i would like to see more sort of like deliberate attention being paid to that is fantastic i think there are people on this call making notes so that's brilliant thank you um just got the message so we've got a little bit under 30 minutes left on the call. In a moment, I'm going to take a couple of questions out of the chat. Um, and also to let you know, Vasha has had to drop off the call. Um, she's uh, not super well. And so um, I'm really grateful that she was able to spend more than an hour with us. Um, Martin, what's your what's on your wish list for Global Greens or for the Federations, uh, African Greens Federation? What do you think we should be doing more or better or different? Oh, we just need you to come off mute. Sorry. Yeah, my wish list is that uh, 
the structure of grains uh, need to be re looked at. I mean, I mean, should be, I mean, uh, my thoughts, because, uh, you know, politics is perceptive. And if you are to package yourself as a political movement, then uh, believability comes with uh, familiar political faces. And I indicated in my earlier presentation that the, the globe is awash with the people who are credible, people with green credentials. And uh, if this can be structured so that uh, we have a global green board that is political uh, from the way we know it, then we will be converting the global greens into a political movement from the shadows of, uh, of, 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 of activism of uh, environmentalists. And uh, I think this can be cascaded down to continental levels, federation levels, that uh, we can have a board there that uh, really represent the, 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 the political faces within those federations. And then, uh, because I think we are fighting a war here that uh, we need to be very clear about. Uh, the climate change is as a result of uh, capitalism, unregulated capitalism, that is seen the pursuit of profits uh, in total disregard to the harm that we are doing to our planet. And uh, the capitalists always want their profit here and now. And uh, while the Greens think that business can be done, clean business can be done, uh, people probably would think that we are delaying their payback period. Uh, they have better investments that can pay them uh, back uh, sooner rather than the green investment that we are thinking about that is sustainable. Uh, I think we need louder, stronger voices to be able to pitch for what we stand for, the green revolution. Uh, we may not necessarily have them as elected leaders, but when we get inspiration from uh, this kind of uh, boards, then uh, people will believe, electorate will believe that indeed this cause is credible and uh, deserves our votes. Uh, I think uh, uh, it is, it, I, I, I'm struggling with it because even the Wright brothers invented the plane, they didn't invent the jet, but I think we need to, we, we need to really convert ourselves into a political movement. And um, how we refine that to fruition, I think is our task as, as, as the global Greens or as the green uh, people in the, this political arena. Amazing. All right, I feel like this call may be the initiation of Project Jet, if this is, uh, if we're gonna, if we're gonna continue with the metaphor. Um, Martin, while we've got you, there's a couple of questions that went into the chat earlier about energy colonialism. I feel like you you kind of touched on it in your presentation, um, but I do want to come back there because a couple of questions were relating to that. What is the threat of energy colonialism in Africa um, and how is it affecting self-determination and political stability? I think, I think it is huge the threat of energy colonialism is huge because uh, like I said, Africa is hosting a lot of natural resources. And uh, this tradition, I mean, in the, in the past attracted colonialists and uh, it led to slavery 
and which really disrupted lives of many people in the South. And today we are thinking about uh, green economy. And we know it that uh, economies are driven by energy. And uh, if you are to drive your economy using clean energy, then uh, I know there are various uh, sources of energy. We have the solar, we have, uh, when you think of solar, Africa is huge in solar. When you think of wind, Africa is huge in wind. When you think of uh, uh, the electric cars, Africa is huge in cobalt and uh, the resources that you'd use to do that. Unfortunately, Africa is not in control of its resources, uh, be it in terms of uh, the nature of, 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 of colonialism, in terms of the nature of uh, dismemberment of Africa, in terms of uh, world trade agreements, in terms of uh, real power, because real power is, is, is exercised by the amount of wealth one controls, real power is military. So we have no uh, leverage, we have no bargaining power when it comes to true bargaining on how resources are to be managed if we are to transit from the fossil energy to renewable or green energy, uh, where, which Africa is hosting. So naturally, because of that weak position that Africa is in, given the historical context of how we have been uh, colonized and uh, we have been given uh, independence, leaves us with, at a weak bargaining power and makes us vulnerable to energy, I mean, colonialism again. So I see it as a big threat, but this is a reality we have to live with uh, because we are not able to uh, debate this thing locally and pass resolutions. More often, the meetings to discuss this will be taken away out of Africa and the decision will come back. So that threat is real. And uh, I think it is only honest discussion that can, but because it is business driven, there can never be honest discussion around this. Uh, what is good for Africa should be good for everybody on the planet. And uh, if we choose to pursue what is good, then I think uh, we can deal with the threat of energy recolonial, uh, recolonization. I really like that formulation. Thank you, Martin. That was, that's great. That covered a lot of complex um, information and concepts. We're starting to run towards the end of the session. <clears throat> and I wanna give all of our panelists the last word really in the sense of, of what's next, where can people go? What can people do on this call if they wanna support your work? But also just wanna throw out one provocation, which is uh, a tactic or a strategy or a technique or something in your work that you've, that you've been doing that really worked. Give us an example of, of something that you think others can learn from that has really worked. Marinelle, I might throw this one to you because I know you've got quite a lot to choose from. Um, what have been your, your favorite organizing tactics or your favorite tactics for getting your message out? For me, it's really, um, it's really knowing who are your audience. It's really knowing who are the people that you're engaging with. Because um, I started my advocacy in the communities. And I know a lot of people in the community who don't know how to read and write. So 
um, orienting them, sensitizing them through a series of talks and seminars will not work with with um with these communities so what we do is we um we form a group of youth to to form as a theater group and we do recitals in communities so we bring with us um generators and then we do theater plays on on the basics of climate change how we can do to adapt and mitigate and the effects and then we also maximize the use of um radio broadcasting so aside from sensitization in schools, because we have to um, we have to level with our audience. We have to make sure that they they would understand what um, what we want them to understand. And it is really important that we contextualize our message because um, for for my side, climate change, climate justice um, concept is really big you know, discussion. And we have to make sure, we have to make sure that our audience would, would relate to that. And they would be able to say, oh, that's the reason why they're, that's the reason why the ocean is already in our front yard, where in fact, before it was, it was not. So those kinds of realization. One, um, one action that, that I'm really proud to be part of is the climate litigation that we did. Um, in 2015, we have submitted, along with other fishermen's organizations, farmers' organization, we have submitted um, a landmark petition to the Commission on Human Rights in the Philippines to ask the Commission on Human Rights to investigate the 47 carbon majors for their human rights violations linked to climate um, impacts. And that is really, that is one of, uh, of, of the petition that was really successful. And in 2019, the Commission on Human Rights said after four years of battling with these carbon majors, um, they said that yes, these corporations can be legally liable based on the evidences that was presented by the scientists with the community witness and a lot of experts that, uh, that, um, that also given that also gave their um, their testimonies in the public hearings that we conducted in New York, in London, and in Manila. From all of the evidences that was presented, it was um, it was uh, it was then um, it, it is now they they the the Commission on Human Rights said that yes, uh, these corporations can be li legally liable for their human rights violations linked to climate impact. And I'm so proud to be the youngest petitioner of that petition, and I have acted as a community witness in New York. And that is, you know, that that shows the power of the community. That shows the power of the people when we go together, even if we 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 just say that we are you know farmers fishermen we are small group of people but if we go together if we gather together that could make a great impact and we do not need to be uh, to be um senators we do not need to be mayor we do not need to be we do not need to have a position a strong position in the society we just need to have our our passion our advocacy that fires um our actions and we go to together collectively and do our action that could make a great difference. And that is also true with the global campaign that I did with Amnesty International, when we call the Philippine government to give a dignified and um, a safe relocation for the victims of the Super Typhoon Haiyan. Um, and it generated ar around 600,000 action from around the world. And that still shows how you know the power of the people if we will do it collectively how how much action we can do together thank you that was amazing i'm i don't really want this call to end but i am watching the clock ticking around julian what's your continuing in that vein what's your favorite stuff that you've seen or done that just kicked ass that you want to share Sure. Just hopping off of that, I really, again, very, it resonated with me. I think part of why people are so stuck is I think we forget that people are really smart, you know, <laughs> you know, try, stop trying to buy and sell everyone all the time. I mean, there is a tendency now with just like an overemphasis, for example, on branding. There's a tendency, like, it almost feels like sometimes, like, some of our the best act, activism and advocates are, like, being taken by this, like, trend of being, like, gimmicky. It's like, oh, we're, it, 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 and it, to me, it always remind, reminds me of this sort of, like, different paradigm, right? It's like, 
to to basically you there are like two types of people people who like build relationships and build movements out of a sense of relationality people are relational versus people who are transactional and i feel like we've had too fucking much of the latter you know like it's like everything is like we're, it's just it's almost commerce you know and i was like like buy one ethos get one free like it, it it has to stop you know and and i think i mean i have seen that personally i'm um, you know like in my own activism in the region with vanuatu with climate vulnerable countries like when you're making that argument and you're coming from a place of integrity you know and and you're you aren't hedging every bet you know on the one hand a on the other b it's just this cleverness this gimmickiness this brand, this almost corporate world view that comes down to like buying and selling something you know it that that has contaminated so many activism sort of sort of activist imaginations and that truly what i've learned in all of my experience that i when you come from a place where you have a relational worldview and you care about like internationalism and you try to make it intimate you're like i have a relationship with you i'm going it's not a bargain for exchange you know it's instead it's like a relationship and it's it's profoundly different i mean but those like and i am in community now with like like other like youth movements across the pacific across the world who are fighting climate change but when they have an event for example people actually leave energized if you know they actually leave um, because something in them was stirred, you know, some, you know, we're calling each other, you know, we have to call each other again, we have to re like imagine what that looks like to call another, you know, we are not doing that. And that is the work that has to be done. And that is the work that happens every single day, not, not just around electoral cycles. I mean, you know, like, obviously, I know activists from that I worked with for two decades straight. And now then they're, they're, they're in the US, right? So they they have this almost their worldview, their even their political imagination is shrinking. It's atrophying. And I'm watching it happen because they live their whole lives from one election to another. It's like right now, like the next thing is like, oh, Biden's not doing enough. So let's galvanize behind the next candidate. As if, as if you know, the world could ever be changed living from one tiny election to another. Like this is a pathetic worldview. It's a very cheap, you know, sort of pathetic version of what robust activism looks like, which is really grounded in relationality, which is really grounded in mutual respect, respect for the earth and respect for each other. And that doesn't take a break. That is the air we breathe. That is what we're building. It has to become cellular or it will not work. That's all. Thank you. Well, wow, speechless. I feel like just pausing. Yeah, exactly, Beck. Mic drop. Smashed it. Um, we only have a few minutes left together, and I'm already feeling like I'm going to miss you all. Um, Martin. Yes. What are your favorite moments, techniques, things, strategies, things you've seen done? What worked? What works for us? Yes, but uh, Scott, you want to give me just a one minute to get back to that a uh, question that I didn't conclude uh, in the manner I would have loved to. You see, this question of uh, colonialism has led to a lot of losses and damages. And uh, I want to borrow from Julian Agwan, who said that we really need to empower local communities. And if local communities are empowered, then uh, we get the best for everybody. And uh, I, I, I had uh, Ma Marin uh, talk about, Marin, I'll talk about uh, the activists that have been killed in fight, I mean, in the course of their activism. I mean, these are losses, it damages, because people feel that you're standing on their way. And uh, the same way I see, uh, the energy colonialism coming with more of loss and damages unless the local communities are empowered to play their roles in 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 uh, towards uh, uh, getting uh, our right uh, energy sources for this planet in a sustainable manner. But let me just come back to this: what has worked for me. Uh, I think what I love most, and this 
uh, came out from my experience in the last COP that I attended in Glasgow. Uh, like I said before, the green ideology in my country is still not very well understood. Even though the little messages that we have been passing is gaining traction. And today, wherever I pass with my team, we are called those greens. And we are referred to as greens, not ideologically, but because people think the green is an identity or maybe is a color identity. But that's a good starting point. And I think uh, we are happy with that. We can build on that. The other thing is uh, when I was in Glasgow, uh, where I attended as an observer, uh, of course, I, I, I was under an illusion that as, a, as an observer, I would get to the meeting rooms, but I didn't. Uh, I think the, meet, the meeting rooms was left for the parties. Uh, but I thought the parties need to be accountable to the world and uh, everybody should have access to the meetings, at least if not to just see how the proceedings go without interfering with the meeting. Uh, but outside the meeting halls in Glasgow, a very powerful tool uh, which I was part of was the, the, the street marches. I think uh, the street marches are very, very powerful tools in uh, sending out these messages because uh, the big people cannot listen to you in a meeting hall or cannot even give you a chance to speak. And uh, when you march outside there, at least directly or indirectly, your message is passed across. And I think that's a very powerful tool. Um, of course, it works in a densely populated area because you are able to mobilize many people within a short time and uh, you, you, you are effective. But when you believe in a cause, you can even picket alone. So I think the art of picketing, demonstrating and marching is a very powerful tool that needs to be exploited, even though uh, uh, you cannot do it every day because people are busy chasing their livelihoods. But I still think it is an all-inclusive tool because you will get, uh, in, in, in Glasgow, I saw babies participate. I saw children participate. I saw the youth participate. I saw people with disability participate. I saw women participate. I saw men participate. I saw the elderly participate. It is a platform for everybody to express themselves. And the beauty is that everybody had a message. You would see everybody carrying their placards, expressing themselves. And uh, what you get is that everybody is concerned about one thing, which is uh, the unsustainability of our planet. And uh, I think we need to exploit this, but again, this thing needs to be taken to the, uh, we need to penetrate where the decisions are made, uh, Scott. I know time is running out and uh, probably I'll leave it there. Thank you, Martin. We are right on the clock. Thanks everyone for the discipline that you've shown somehow amidst all of the passion that we're bringing to this, we are gonna finish on time. And we need to because we are just about to lose our translation team. So on behalf of everyone on this call to Kumano-san, to Mitsumoto-san and to Kozuma-san, our hardworking translation team, thank you, Otsukare Samades. Uh, they've got to run, I think, directly to the next session. And so we're going to give the rest of the participants a little break as well. I feel like this session has... Um, summarized all of the reasons why I love being involved in this political party that is somehow on its way to becoming a movement, that we have one foot in parliaments and in assemblies 
and in candidates and in electoral systems, but we always have one foot in social movements and in civil society organizations. If we forget that, then we would cease to exist. There would be no purpose to us if we don't retain those very deep grassroots connections with movements, with social movements across borders around the world, then I think uh, there'd be no point to this party. We, uh, we've heard um, such incredible points of view and speakers from all over the world today. And I know this is just a microcosm of the rest of this conference that's rolling around the whole planet's time zones. But for me, it's cemented the importance of thinking outside artificial nationalisms which was the theme that we kind of brought into this. What's the role of the global green, specifically transcending these artificial European, often colonial imposed borders that are lines on maps, but they can also be lines in our heads and we need to bring those down. So I wanna thank uh, everybody for the expertise and the love that you brought to this session and to the work that you do. Hope to see you again. I think the conference organizers will be back in touch fairly soon the recordings uh, with transcripts if if that's something that we're doing that can be organized as well uh, and if you want to connect with any of our speakers that can be organized as well but thank you so much uh, also thanks to Nick it's kind of the tip of the iceberg of the huge volunteer team that's worked behind the scenes to bring this conference together and make it possible have a quick look at uh, what's been thrown into the chat if you're one of our participants as well there the post-conference survey uh, how to continue this conversation. The most important thing isn't necessarily how we've spent the last 90 minutes, but what comes of it? What actions do we take now? What connections do we make stronger? And how do we take this work forward out into the world? So yeah, I found it a real privilege um, to be uh, your MC and to help get this conversation rolling. Thank you so much to everybody for everything that you've brought to it. And we'll see you at the next one.